So let's start with the p value. I'm sure you all know what the p value is, right? So p value less than 0 0.05, greater than 0 0.05, and define your destiny, <laughs> probably. So we will talk about why uh, we use a p-value in the medical research. So the example, and will you marry me, Mary? And yes, John, only if you can prove me that love is our destiny. So how can we prove love is their destiny? <laughs> All right. So John, first he tried, sure again, Mary, many wonderful things happen since I met you. So, love must be our destiny. What do you think? Is this convincing? Wonderful thing happened. And then Mary said, well, I had a wonderful things happen even before I met you. <laughs> <laughs> I had a bit. Yeah, there are many wonderful things happen after you, we met. But I'm not sure I'm quite convinced. Mm -hmm. So John came to me. Dr. Shintani, what can I do? Mary, it's hard to believe that our love happened just by chance alone. Okay? And if it happened just by chance alone, the probability of both of us came from other side of the universe. Okay? Met in Sarma Institute statistics course, chances 0 0.0000001, one out of a million. Right? I computed it. So, <laughs> love must be our destiny. And Mary said, yeah, yeah, that sounds right. So you convinced me and I marry you. <laughs> so there are two ways. Okay, so first, John tried to prove love with the destiny. And the second, he started, okay, he started, love happened just by chance. Okay. So it wasn't their destiny. And he computed the chance, chance of miracle happened, right? And then he convinced. So there are two ways to raise evidence. So which one do you think you want to use for scientific evidence? All right. So, <clears throat> so what John did first is try to collect evidence to prove love with their destiny. And then second, right? He started. Love was not their destiny. Okay? It was not. It just happened just by chance. And then he computed evidence and said, "It's hard to believe it happened by chance alone because probability was so small, one out of miracle." So then he convinced Mary, "It must be miracle. That means love must be our destiny." Okay. So you can actually do the same thing for your research. And typically scientific evidence and we do this way. Okay. So we don't start where the drug works. We always start what if drug doesn't work. Yeah. And then we compute the evidence. Okay. If drug doesn't work, what is the probability of you seeing this big difference in your experiment? Okay. Or greater greater difference. So you're starting drug doesn't do anything. So what is the chance for you to see this difference? So that's a p-value. This defines p-value. So p-value is a probability of a seeing of a certain difference, a greater difference, when your drug does not work completely. So truth is no. So do you want the p-value smaller or bigger? Smaller, right? Yeah. So if John computed, say, 50% of chance that they are love happening by chance, and then Mary said, yeah, then they must be happening by chance, right? It's <laughs> not the destiny. So the p-value, we want to have it smaller. Yeah. So another terminology for p-value is the probability of making a mistake. Yeah. So when you know the drug doesn't work, and the p-value shows the probability your hypothesis is wrong. Drug, it's not drug, it's not working. And it may be drug is working. So the probability of making mistake is that the p-value. Okay. So why we prefer this way to prove your hypothesis in science? Why we can't prove a okay drug works? Why we can't directly prove that? 
we knew it for you to prove drug works, you can't start drug works, right? You you go to where drug doesn't work. And then you compute the p-value to against the hypothesis that drug doesn't work. So you reject the new hypothesis, we call it the new hypothesis. Okay, the hypothesis that the drug doesn't work is a new hypothesis. And then when you reject the new hypothesis with a small p-value, and then you may accept the alternative hypothesis that drug works. Okay. So this is how we prove things in science. <laughs> so why is that? Why we don't directly prove A, we prove B, we disprove B, then we prove A. Okay. So let's think, uh, if you want to prove water boil at 100 uh, degrees centigrade, and how can you raise uh, evidence, bring evidence? So if you try to do A, and try to prove a hypothesis that the water boils at 100 degrees centigrade, and you have to boil water in Tennessee, Nashville, or Murfreesboro, in New York, or Atlantic Ocean, Japan, China, everywhere, right? So let's say I want to travel everywhere, 100 places, I boil water, and then it always boils at 100 degrees centigrade, right? So you collected 100 evidence. But then, what if the sun won? Well, you me, and I went to uh, Mount Fuji or Mount Everest, and I boiled water then. It boiled at 95 degrees. Okay. And then, one evidence can reject all hypotheses. Right? So rejecting evidence is easy. You need only one evidence to reject. But accepting evidence, hypothesis, is very hard. Even if you boil water 100 places, it's not enough. You have to go Saza, you have to go millions. It's still not enough. If you have just one case to against your hypothesis, you will reject it. So, uh, that's why in science, uh, we try to disapprove evidence rather than directly approve evidence. Does that make sense? So, we always start if drug work doesn't work. Right? Okay? So, the p-value is probability of showing you know, uh, the big difference and you are observing a greater difference. So when the new hypothesis is true, that means drug doesn't work at all. But what is the chances for you to observe that great difference? Okay, so if it's one out of millions and you say it cannot be happening just by chance alone, that means our originating hypothesis is wrong. So that must prove drug works, in fact. Okay, so we disapprove new hypothesis and then we accept the alternative hypothesis. Okay, so here's a trick. All right, I say that we accept the uh, alternative hypothesis, but there is a caution, and I want you to uh, remember. Right, so when the p value is bigger than 0.05, I mean, conventionally we use 5%. So if the probability of showing the observed difference, or you see greater difference, is 0.01 out of 100. And then what happened? We compare that with 5%, and then if your chance of making a mistake is less than 5%, and then it cannot be happening just by chance alone. So we accept alternative hypothesis, right? And then the reason we use 5%, why we use 5%? There's no scientific reasons. A statistician, uh, <coughs> statisticians called uh, the Fisher, the hundred years ago, and then he came up with one of twenty, probably one of twenty, and then I think that's uh, probably good enough evidence. So uh, I allow you if you make a mistake, one out of twenty times. <laughs> so he actually picked five percent. And we are 100 years later, we used to use it as saying, uh, I would really take the p value, I mean, probability. So that is uh, 
no scientific reason we have to stick with 5%. You can decide your own. So if the Mary says, well, John, uh, chance we, we met, I mean, the probability we met the chance at all is 5%. Is that convincing? <laughs> <laughs> For your marriage, you think it's, you, you need a greater evidence, not just 5%. But in medicine, we use 5%. <laughs> yeah. All right, so here. And this is an example I used when I gave a talk in Japan. Um, anyway, so we are comparing uh, two doses um, to cure uh, the children with the rare kidney disease. Um, and then a p-value was 0 0.006. So the p-value, the chance of making a mistake is if it's less than 5%, and then we say, well, no, it's not happening just by chance alone, and then drug must work. So that's a conclusion you have, right? And then what they did is that they grab a subset of patients, they repeated analysis with about a half of a patient, and then, so you see the similar difference, separations, but p-value in this case was 0 0.06. Okay? So given this, here is a question for you. Should we say drug doesn't work in this case? So the many times that people grab this p-value, if it's greater than 0 0.05, and then they accept the null hypothesis to say drug doesn't work. There is no difference. Is this the uh, right statement to make? So go back. So we say if the p-value is less than 5% and we reject the null hypothesis, we accept the alternative, right? So what happens if the p-value is greater than 0.05? Can we accept the no? That means your conclusion is two drugs are the same. It's just one, one more. <laughs> yeah, right. Is, uh... <laughs> so now you know how silly P value is, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's the best way to Yeah, so what do you think? So clinical difference is similar, right? You have a smaller sample size with this. So look. Here you have 44 patients, here you have only 33 patients, so a little bit over half. But uh, with a smaller sample size, what happened is your analysis did not have enough power to detect the same difference. Clinically, very similar difference. Okay? Right? So here, and I would say we did not have uh, enough evidence to say two drugs are different. Why we didn't have enough evidence? It could be lack of clinical difference or could be lack of sample size. Okay. So the p-value is purely depend on sample size. Okay. There are three things actually. Sample size and actual difference and variation of your data. Okay. The three things. So, uh, <coughs> okay. so you might so this person right, can climb all the way up to a mountain and then I ask the statistician, how can I do to improve <laughs> my p-value? And then statistician say, well, I can't change the effect of drug. Your drug is already developed, right? There's nothing I can do. And then variations, some variations are due to patient. Okay. And I can't improve that. You can improve your tools, but you, I'm, I'm sure you're doing the best you can do, but you can't really shrink patient variations, right? So all I can advise you is have a larger N and low as many people as you can, right? So that directly makes you smaller people. <laughs> I've seen that in our just a little bit increase in control of the... Uh, the drag, the drag. And, uh, it's significant. It's significant. And then probably yeah, the study. It was like 50 or 60 years. Right. Okay. So it's really uh, important for you not to make a wrong conclusions. Bigger p-value doesn't mean drug does not work at all. It could be just a lack of evidence, lack of sample size. Okay. So we covered this. So in this case, what do you conclude? Right. 
clinically you are seeing important difference or that your analysis did not have enough and to prove that, right? That's it. So clinical significance, statistical significance, which one should we buy? Many people actually just grab p value, don't even look at data. Right? There are some biological processes which is not statistically significant, but That's still right. you know value. That's right. So the another yeah, another example. This is a uh, other paper published by this Japanese group, and then they show um, this is a rare disease, you know, uh, children with a rare kidney disease. So n is maximum they could get. Okay, and this is a multi-center trial. So we're not really talking about just one center. This is really the best they could do. Okay, and then they know this is this much difference is happening. So they have they know this drug worked. But n is only 29, so the p-value was 0.09. Okay, it was a negative study. And another study, and this is published from the New England Journal of Medicine. Right, and then, um, so this one, uh, they use a drug, uh, teotropium, in versus control drug, and then they showed an improvement in asthma, I mean COPD exacerbation. Right. So this is a flip of Kevlar Meyer curve. <laughs> so cumulative proportion of reaching events, okay, exacerbation of COPD, without treatment, that was 43. With the treatment, 36%. P-value, very strong. <laughs> because N was very large. This is a positive study. So what do you think? People think this is a negative study. And then they may trash this treatment, right? mm -hmm. even though you see a clinically big difference, yeah, because n is small. But this one clinically, it could be trivial difference, but p value was strong. Okay? So this was published from New England Journal of Medicine. So here, uh, take home message is don't just look at the p value. You do have to look actual differences. What is the improvement this drug made? Is that clinically relevant? Okay. So if it's not clinically relevant, there is no need to even provide it as a So clinical significance should come first. Okay. So what the statistics is doing? The okay. statistical difference. No hypothesis is there is no difference. Right? So we reject that difference. So that means actual hazard ratio could be, do we have a hazard ratio for this, right? So this study computed has a ratio of 0 0.63, and the p-value is trying to raise evidence whether this hazard ratio is not the same as one. That's all we do. It could be 0.9, it could be 0.95, we don't know. But all we need is a p-value is evidence to show this 0.63 is not the same as one. Right. So when the summer repeat their study, and with this small sample size, they know, I know this much difference, but with a small sample size, and when someone repeat their study, we don't know what actually happened to the new study because of small n. Okay. Result could be this huge, but with the data variation small n, the result could be unstable, so we don't know what happened if they repeat. But with this New England Journal of Medicine, N is very large. So they know, PVAD is telling, we know for sure, nearly, you cannot say for sure, but uh, we know pretty much, this difference is not the zero. It could be 1%, it could be 2% difference, but we know it's not the zero. Okay, so that's what the PVAD is assessing. P value is not telling this much difference is really very important rather than this much difference. It's all we can say is when someone repeat their study and a new study will show some difference. So maybe having similar end would reproduce the result? Right, right. But you know, as an intuition, yeah, we know this is small n, but. You know, I'm saying that. Yeah. Someone has like 100, any percent. Yeah. Any 
high probability that it can reproduce. Yeah, right, right. It re reproduces. But then, amount of reproduction, we don't know. It could be this much different, could be this much difference, but we know for sure it won't be zero. So that's all we are assessing with the p-value. So always, uh, I want you to look at actual difference in p-value, both, okay? And then make your own judgment. Yeah, this is showing with the new drug, it improved by uh, probability of a COPD exacerbation by 7%. So that's what they are telling you. <laughs> but whether you think this is a clinically important or not is up to you to decide. So don't, be, don't just be driven by p-value. <laughs> it's important, you know, that's the best <laughs> You have to probably they want a small p value, but what happened is with this small study, okay, uh, let me rephrase. So if, okay, uh, I mean, you were to buy a stock from these two different companies, and uh, one company showed this evidence, the, uh, the other company showed this evidence, okay? This is company A, this is company B, and uh, which company do you buy a stock from? I know you would say B because its stock is already high, right? <laughs> because of this paper. <laughs> but you know, it's already high, so we probably don't make money. But what's the promising? It's probably this. In this study, if they enroll a few more patients, it could flip. You know, P value could go smaller. It could become smaller than the product that can see. Yeah. But you're assuming that, right? Yeah, I'm assuming it. Yeah. But I think if you're, uh, you probably can assume better than a statistician. <laughs> so our assumption is based on no experience in clinical settings. Yeah. Okay. So take home message, don't put too much emphasis on p-value. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so what happened to this paper? Well, the old is that we did everything we could. This is a rare disease. And there is no other evidence in the universe. This is the only evidence. Okay. And then they said a uh, lack of p value due to lack of sample size because the nature of disease is very rare. That's, I think it's very convincing, right? Convincing. Yeah, well, that's your paper, your And in this case, reviewer said they didn't listen. I mean, reviewer didn't listen to what the author said. So they let the author to conclude this way. It's a disaster. Let's read. Okay. The time to the first flare from a treatment initiation was not significantly different between the two groups. That was the conclusion. If I were them, I would break it this way. Clinically meaningful, the reduction of the flare was observed, though it did not reach the disease significant due to a small sample size. Yeah. So you can add that to the Yeah, yeah, you can add that. So I would write this in the abstract and we'll write it this way. So if you say there is not significant difference, people might read it as there is no difference. Mm -hmm. right? Now there is clinical no difference. No clinical difference, no statistical difference. So don't even admit. Yeah. Well, we have a big difference. It's important to tell, right? And then you say, although it didn't reach the disease significance because which is a fair statement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then you have a half negative paper. <laughs> not the completely negative paper. And then conclusion, you say, 
we detected the clinical important difference, and therefore we need further evidence. Right? We need more funding to collect more data. <laughs> so you don't have to trust your study. Okay? But if you know the, this difference is so tiny, <laughs> then I wouldn't put much effort to go further. Okay? So be careful with p-value. So that's the pitfall using p-value. So what can we do in order not to miss important, clinically important difference? Then you want to make sure you have enough sample size to be in okay. And so if you know 50 is not enough, and then you just have to enroll more, 60 or 70. So before you initiate the study, and always you have to do sample size estimation. And before you collect the study, you can't even guess, right? You don't have that kind of matter. And so you just make your best judgment. So study uh, the papers other people published and then make a judgment how much different you think your study will see. And then use the sample size software to compute what is enough sample size to detect that big study study significant difference. Yeah. Almost always. And whenever, when you write the grant for NIH, you do need a sample size computation. When you publish a paper, you do need a sample size computation. And then sample size computations does not happen after you collect the data. It has to be done before you collect the data. Okay, so that's it for p-value. And we move on to next topic, mean and median. Have any questions about p-value? It's okay with the mice to increase the number of the patients. There's no telling that one of the patients is going to get through. And then later, maybe like a trial, things like that. Yeah, so, so right. Those are the dictators of the Yeah, that's right. So you have to know N before you enroll your first patient. So in Japan, actually, we don't have many institutions, especially in academia. So I was involved in, I mean, involved in many things. but. Uh, I'm reviewing a protocol for this company, and then uh, many protocols, they said, since there is no data existing for this drug, so we want to start off anyway with 20 patients. <laughs> and then after 20 patients, we know how much we need in the drug, and we do sample size computation, <laughs> and then compute how many we need to finish the study. And no, that's, you can't do it. <laughs> You can't do it. Um, as I mentioned a little bit, it, when you start looking middle of the study, you start penalizing significant level. So if you look many times, you cannot use 5% cutoff anymore. So you should use 5%. You have to make it 5% lower and lower and lower, make it harder to detect the difference if you start looking more and more. So they could, they could do that as long as they didn't include those 20 people in their final analysis. They try. They try. Yeah. As a pilot study, they can do it. But then, once they look, they don't have any term analysis plan, no monitoring plan. They say, I look at anyway. That means those 20 people, they can't count when they actually do the study. So if they enroll with the 80 patient, total end won't be 100. <coughs> they will be 80. Yeah. Because this is a pilot study, and this is your optional study. Unless you use a special statistical technique called the Bayesian. There is a approach called the Bayesian. You could use the data in time. And then with Bayesian, you can look as many times as you want. So that's an advanced problem. But uh, Bayesian does not involve p value. So even if it's done in the same institution, the same thing, you can convert that data? I think with you, know, you could combine, but you cannot use 5%. Yeah, we call it a descending rule. So you are allowed to make a mistake up to 5% in total interstate. So if you look five times, you're spending that too much. So you can't spend 5% five times. That would be 25%. That means each time you have to spend 1%. 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, and then total of 5%. That means your final analysis, if you have value of 0.03, <laughs> you don't have a statistical significance because you already spend it. Yeah, spend it to p-value. 
for alpha level, significant level before that. So you are left only with 1% for your final analysis. That means p-value have to be less than 1% for you to prove there is a difference. So this is a pitfall of p-value. And the Bayesian is a new concept. It doesn't even have a p-value concept. There is no p-value in Bayesian. And then Bayesian, and then you actually try to estimate how much uh, new drug differ from placebo. So more work you do is actually improve uh, precisions. Bayesian. So if you are doing a Bayesian analysis, Bayesian sample size computation, you can recompute sample size. The infinite number. Okay. In a CQS, the decision can do it for you. <laughs> so please ask them if you think you know you, you have an urgent need to terminate your study, like uh, bird flu. Uh, when the vendor will actually assess the vaccines for bird flu, um, and they did use a Bayesian. Uh, you can do it to look many times and stop the trial as early as possible. But the regular software doesn't do it. So then we, you need to ask statisticians to do it. Right. So let's move on. Uh, so mean and standard deviation and median and integral range. And I'm sure many of you are already familiar with uh, mean and standard deviation. So let's start with mean and standard deviation. This is a paper uh, published in uh, 2004 with uh, one of my collaborators I mean, looking at the delineum in ICU. So, uh, we are not really talking about the analysis we did it here, but I wanted to use baseline characteristic tables. Uh, so this study, okay, so we look Apache 2 score. So this is a severity score. It predicted death in ICU using admission ICU uh, information. Okay. So people who end up developing delineum during ICU study, Apache score is 24.6. And then parenthesis. So what the in parenthesis is a standard deviation. Okay. So mean is 25.6 and then parenthesis standard deviation by 8.1. When you see this, okay, what is the uh, utility of 8.1? I'm sure everybody can understand the mean, right? So mean Apache score is higher with delineum than the non delineum. So that means Apache might be uh, associated with delineum. And everybody understands me, but what is this? Can you use the information of 8.1? It tells you about possible reactions for where the mean is 66% of them will fall within 8.1 above or below 8.5%. Great, good, good. I'm glad you say 60, yeah, 66%, yeah, 60, yeah, yeah. So that is the right explanation. And then 66 or 67 percent, and it's not intuitive. So what we do is we multiply 8.1 by 2, okay? And then we do mean plus minus. Uh, let's see. I'll show. You. Okay, I have this. I have so many animations, but anyway. All right, let's close your eyes. <laughs> and we move to the next. I'll come back to the graph anyway. Okay. So what we do is. If you do, okay. if you do mean plus minus 8.1, okay, and then that defines interval. So this interval is 17.5 to 33.7. So this means if you have the normally distributed data, if you know Apache score is normally distributed, and then 67% patients Apache score are falling within that range. So that's what SD means. 67% does not really link to anything. So what we do is we multiply by 2. So and then we you do a mean plus minus 2 uh, times 8.1 and then define the range. And then this range, and we can say if the data are normally distributed, 95% of patient about to score fall in uh, that range. Okay. And then I asked uh, the PI of this study, is that the case? And he said, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. almost always. But Few patients are out of that range, so 95% probability of yes. Okay, so this is the utility of a standard deviation. And so, when you look at the data, so this is a different data, but anyway, let's go. I don't want to go 
video and animation part. But anyway, this is the different data. This is the table two from the same paper. And what we want to see this is uh, if there is association between use of a drug, dose of a drug, to instance of delinium. Okay. And then here, uh, this is a dose of each drug used within 24 hours before delinium assessment. And then, uh, let's see, can we do that? Daily and daily, right? So that four, there is a 4.8 milligram as a mean uh, dose of molybdenum used for patients and who had it. So this is the daily average of molybdenum. Yeah. So what did this mean? 12.8. That's a standard deviation. So in order to make use of this, what you do is times two, right? So what is times two? I, had, I deleted all Japanese from my slide. I had one left. Yeah. So this is a range. Does this make sense? 95% observations are falling within range of minus 20.8 to 30.4. We are talking about dose of drug. Why it's minus? Why it's minus? Thank you, you know already. Right, because it's not normally distributed. So, uh, the claim we are making is valid only when data are normally distributed. So, look at the actual data. So, this is the dose of molybdenum. You can see many people even didn't use the molybdenum to zero, right? But some people, there's a huge uh, drug addict, uh, addict people, um, they don't respond to lower doses, so they keep increasing at low. So some people do use a much higher drug. Right? So it's a heavily, heavily skewed data. It's not normally distributed, right? So normal distribution, you have a center, and cluster, biggest cluster goes to center of data, and then you have symmetric distributions. Okay. Go both ways. But here, it's bumped at zero because it cannot go negative, but then it's skewed uh, to the higher value. So what you did is you force data to be normally distributed, and then therefore, and here you end up having a negative numbers. Okay. So be careful. Standard deviations, many people use it to describe data, although it does not make much sense unless data are normally distributed. So based on this, and we actually change uh, our strategies to describe data, and we now use median and integral range. Okay. So, uh, so it's this data. I think I have to. Sorry. I thought I fixed it, but. Um, Okay, so median is 1, and then interquarter range is 0. And so what the median? Median is, so let me explain median. So if I ask you to make a line from shortest, person with the shortest height to the person with the highest height, it's strange English, but anyway, shortest to highest by height, Okay. If you grab a person who are standing on the middle, okay, and that person's height, we call it median height. Okay. And the interquartile range we are defined. So, so in interquartile range is defined from a range from 25th percentile to 75th percentile. So, if you, you have 100 people lining on this line, and the person's, person who are lining on 25th from the beginning, and that person's height is 25th percentile, and same, and the person who are lining on 75th, and that person's height is 75th percentile. Okay? So, but this range we call the interquarter range. And so, the newer papers we no longer use median standard deviation, but we use median to describe the data. So table one, to get rid of standard deviation.
great question. I actually didn't include this in my slide. I usually talk about this when I talk about confidence. And then we do talk about confidence about today, but I actually didn't hear about it. So, a proven indicator is very difficult. I mean, it's not as easy as you can prove it with a larger p okay. And so, if you want to prove, uh, let's say, a uh, generic drug, okay. uh, generic drug is, I mean, when we to prove, we want to develop a generic drug, right? Because a new drug is experimenting with the pattern. So, it could be really like to develop the same drug. But the, when we prove, FDA prove uh, genetic drug, you have to prove new drug is the same as old drug, right? So the proven equivalency is something we do uh, in the many cases, okay? So if you think with larger p-value can prove the equivalence, what can we do? P-value point 0.8, can we approve a new genetic drug to put it in the market? How can we get to p-value point eight? <laughs> it's easy. Yeah. It's easy, right? Just enroll to <laughs> So we can have a large p-value. It's very easy. And historically, this is uh, many times ago. FD A was using p-value to prove the difference. And then end up having a junk drug in the market. Right, so you can't use a p-value. So whenever you want to prove equivalence, can't use a p-value. We have to construct a confidence interval, actually. And I'll talk about confidence interval. And then you have to show confidence interval is small enough so you are with a good accuracy computing differences this much. Yeah. So to have a confidence, small confidence interval, you need a large, large, uh, large number of n. Sure that. And then I will talk about confidence interval. So never use p value to prove equivalence. And then pay attention, okay, when you review your paper, pay attention if the author is aiming to prove equivalence or not. Okay. And then if that is the case, they use a p value, it's wrong. Can't do that. Yeah. I actually have a great slide for that, and, but I don't. In, I didn't include it in here, but I I can show you. Yeah, yeah. When we talk about confidence interval. Um, okay, so let me uh, finish this, and then we can talk about confidence interval. Um, okay, so the newer papers, what we do is instead of using mean in the standard deviation, and we use median in either quarter range. So for this one, uh, we have a benzodiazepine instead of lorazepam in this paper. This is a newer paper from the same group we published in Lancet. And a result of RCT, and then we actually showed an improvement in our uh, new ways of treating a patient in a CCU. But anyway, uh, so here, medium of 10. So you know, uh, if you have all patients, and then from lowest dose to highest dose, and the middle patient's dose is 10. Okay, and then two means and the first a quarter of a patient can okay, use uh, two milligrams. So that means 25% of patients' uh, benzodiazepine dose is less than two milligrams. Okay, and then you know 75% of patients use the lowest benzo benzos and less than 41 milligrams. So using mean and meter quarter range, you can actually describe data pretty well. So you don't have to stick with mean and standard deviation. And the good thing about median and integral range is it's a round of pace statistics, right? It's, uh, <coughs> it's not affected by outlier. Right. So let's see, I'm a teacher of kindergarten, <laughs> kindergarten and then their age is five, right? Or four, five, or six, in you know, right? And then we compute the mean of age of that kindergarten, right? And then, uh, so let's compute the mean of age for uh, people who are in this room. All right? You and me define. And then the school principal came in, and his age is, let's say, 70. <laughs> so now the mean is jumped, <laughs> right? So that doesn't mean you know, their age is uh, uh, 8 or 9. It's just the fact the principal is the age of 70, so that put me in a way. But this is the median. So if you line up these children from 
youngest to oldest. And even the oldest person's age is 70, it doesn't change the age of the child running in between in middle, right? In middle of this. Uh, so ranking is not affected, affected by outlier. So um, so median and integral derange, we call it more of a non-parametric measurements. And mean and standard deviation, it's assume normality, right? And that we call it, it's more parametric measurements. Yeah. Non-parametric method we will be talking when we do statistics is robust for our model, but not the parametric method. Okay. So some of you might have a question. What if, you know, some of these data, like age, uh, Apache, we know they are usually normally distributed. So can I, we just use a mean and standard deviation for some variable? But the sum, like a drug uh, doors or uh, length of postal stack, we know it's obviously skewed. We just use median integral derivative. Some people do that, but I don't do it because it's so confusing if you start flipping mean and median within the same table. Okay, so median, you know, median is not affected by outlier. It's always valid. <coughs> so why don't we just use median for everything? Or integral the range for everything? So you can use median integral the range for skewed data. It still makes sense. Okay. It still works with the normally distributed data. So why don't we stick with it? So new and newer paper, we are just using this. I used to see median and then a 95% confidence interval. Why is it your Oh, um, median is a rank based. So you could compute 95% confidence interval for median, but it's not as straightforward. Okay. So usually median go with integral the range, but unless special occasions. I guess my question is what's special about 75% and 25%? It's nothing. It's arbitrary. Yeah, just arbitrary. So some people use a range. That means minimum and maximum. I don't like that. <laughs> Because that could be driven by a lot of Recently, the last thing we represent all the dots in the block. So mm -hmm. you right, right, yeah. They yeah. yeah. show everything, right? That's actually better. Yeah, now I got your point. So, interquarter range is defined by 5th percentile and 95th percentile. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could do that. Because mm -hmm. this 75 percentile is arbitrary. Okay. So ST is good to describe data, and then it has a good utility if data is normally distributed. And then typically we multiply ST by two, and then compare that to 95%. Okay, and so let's, all right, um, let's look at the graph then. Right? When you use SPSS or other software, okay, we are typically faced to choose <laughs> Uh, what type of errors, and then we put it in the graph. There are three options usually. One, SD, one, SE, and then one, CR, confidence interval, right? So you need to pick which one to put to construct errors. Okay. So which one of these do you think is statistically significant? So we're comparing drug A and drug B, and then we are plotting mean of like blood pressure, for example. Okay. And then we want to show uh, p-value for this graph and link it to the graph and error bars. And then we all know error bar indicates and variations of the graph, right? Okay. But error bars can go with either of this. So which one should we be using? Right? So who thinks, hey, in this case, okay, error bars is for SE. And it is showing statistically significant. And by the way, I didn't explain what the SC. SC is, okay, so you know what the ST, right? I didn't explain. ST is easy. So how you compute SD and what you do is you measure distance from each observation to the mean. Okay. So if this is the value of Apache of each person, and then you calculate the distance from each observation to the mean of 25 in this case, okay? Take average of the distance. So that's defined standard deviation. Okay. 
So if average is larger, that means variation is larger. If average is smaller, variation is smaller. Right? So that's SD. SE, you divide SD by square of sample size. So if you have 100 patients, square root of 110. And if SD by this taking average of this is 2, SC is 0.2. Okay. So SD, SE is always smaller than SD. Okay. And then what is the confidence interval? Confidence interval is twice as uh, large as SE. Okay. So that's uh, how you link the three. Right. And then let's see if you put the error words with SE, error words are not overlapping. And how many of you think these two groups are different? You think? All right, how about this one? You put this error bar twice as large and then construct the error bar. That is a confidence interval, especially 95% confidence interval. And then now they are overlapping. All right, how many of you think they just did this? And how about ST? Okay. All right, so here is the answer. Okay. ST has nothing to do with statistical significance. So huge errors of ST overlapping completely, it doesn't link to significance difference or not difference. And then uh, SE does not link directly to P value. But directly linked to P-value is confidence interval, which is twice as high as a standard error. Okay. So almost always uh, use confidence interval if you want to make statistical inference. That means if you want to compare. Yeah. Okay. But be careful. Sometimes a little bit of overlapping confidence interval shows statistical difference. So what we can say for sure, if confidence interval is not overlapping, we know for sure that it's statistical significance. A little bit of overlap, you may still see statistical difference. But if it start overlapping a lot, and then we know it's not um, the evidence of statistical significance. So uh, almost always use confidence interval. And how many of you seen error bar is for standard error? <laughs> Many posters on the corridors use standard error. I don't understand it. <laughs> yeah. Is it ever the right thing to use? It always looks great. But it looks great right because it's the shortest, right? It's the smallest. Is there ever a time where it's the appropriate test? So, when does it exist? <laughs> it's a misuse. It's, yeah. Don't use it. See it anywhere in your paper. Anywhere. So, so there is no type of statistical analysis or Unless you're judging p value less than point, um, it's not point 0.5, but it's uh, less than point 0.3, 0.33. So, yeah, if you are using point 0.33 to claim statistical significance instead of point 0.05, yeah. then that makes sense. But there's no occasions. No. Right. The other thing that doesn't have a guideline. Okay. Use SD to describe your data. When you describe your data, table one. Right? Use SD or the intercontinental range, of course. And then when you want to make statistical inference, what is the statistical inference? Use your data to guess what happened in the greater population. So that's conclusion, right? So it's more of a conclusion of your paper, result of your analysis. <coughs> use confidence interval. Okay. Never use standard error. It's confusing. Right, right. It's the same thing. Even the standard deviations in table one, you need to multiply by two. <laughs> yeah. So almost always we have to multiply by two, but don't multiply confidence interval by two because it's already <laughs> multiplied by two. Um, I have experience before. Uh, I computed the confidence interval right? and then gave it to uh, one of my collaborators. And then he divided it by square root of n. <laughs> because he thought I gave him some deviation. And then the final publication. So 
errors is this tiny. You were almost invisible. So I had to explain him. I give you confidence in that you didn't have to do anything. But anyway, yeah, so be careful. Right. So better actually graph than the error bars. And more and more, we are starting to use non-parametric graph, which is a box viscous plot. And box viscous plot, then we plot the median and interval <coughs> difference. And so uh, using median and integral the range, and we don't have to, um, we actually, uh, we can show, this graph can even show how data are distributed. So by looking at the error bars, who thinks this, uh, let's say the outcome is the blood pressure, blood pressure is normally distributed. Some people actually say that. Error bars is symmetric, and then you have beautifully distributed, no, normally distributed data. Oh, come on. <laughs> so what the computer did for you is compute the average from each data to the mean, compute the standard deviation, and then just do the plus minus of that. Yeah, it's always symmetric. That doesn't mean data are symmetric. So, yeah. so how do you evaluate the confidence interval data when you read papers and the standard data like that mm -hmm. to make sure that that is significant? Look at the minimum overlap between the bars. Yeah, okay. right. So this one, if it doesn't overlap, you know for sure p value is less than one of that. But tiny overlap, so, many times it's okay. So, so, so it's, it's not the black and white. So, so they don't have to tell you what you know. Right, you have to tell p value. Yeah, so it's not the black and white judgment. Many people think a little bit of overlap indicates insignificance of people, but it's not. It's okay to have a little bit of overlap. So do you mean any population is better to use the CI if the p-value is a... Yeah, yeah. That way the reader doesn't have to multiply by two. If it's SD, so that means always you need to label what they are. Many papers, they don't even tell what the reader is for. Yeah. On the way to your office today, okay? See how many posters and you see and how many of them are not even say what their errors were. <laughs> so what is that? What, so then it's the decorations. What is their errors? Why they put their error? It's a decorated accent right on your poster. <laughs> it's not just a decoration, it's statistic, it has meaning to it. <laughs> I think people think it's a decoration, right? It's looking nice rather than just putting a bars, right? Put some error bars. Well, like the Lewis group represents. Yeah. Uh, you ask? Okay. So I think all right. This is the real data, right? This is the real data. Many John actually likes actual data points uh, overlay with the box whiskers plot. And actually, okay, here's it. So if you put the box. Uh, which has a length uh, 1.5 times larger than this box. Okay? And then whispers is drawn where uh, you see the maximum observations. So that means there is no observations in here, and this is the highest you can get within, um, I can't even explain it, if you have a box which is 1.5 times larger than this box. And that means a lowest whiskers, and you have box in the box appearing here, and this is the lowest value within that box. And at least this is how SPSS defines it. So the largest, so the largest, so it, it, it's marked the largest data point that is three quarters, that's still less than three quarters of the height of the main box. Right, right, so here, um, three quarters, right, yeah, that's right, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, Where did that come from? <laughs> I don't know who decided one point where. It depends on software. Some software might use height of more two or um, three. I'm not sure. SPSS actually paid 1.5 uh, times larger than the box. Okay. And then, so usually when you put the graph, and make sure you put the n, if you can, and p-value within the figure. Don't put it in the footnote. No one read your footnote. <laughs> 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 
when you have a letter from a reviewer and then they say, authors didn't specify this. Wait, Dad, they said it in here, they just didn't read it. <laughs> that means you didn't put it in the, in the location and reviewer could see it. That means the same thing as you did in um, So it's better to put the p value on the graph, not in the footnote. All right, so we are done with mean and the standard deviation, median and interquartile range. So, uh, I mean, more and more papers we start using this kind of graph rather than this. Excuse me, I want to ask what's that uh, the last bar? Uh, there are around two points uh, larger than uh, the maximum. What does that mean? Is this? Yeah, uh, this is actual data point. So these are the data which is not within this box. Mm -hmm. So they plot it as outliers. Okay. Yeah. So SPSS use this symbol to show outlier, and then they actually do have uh, extreme outliers. So you, when you start seeing asterisk of a star, and that's even extreme outliers. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So now we talk about confidence interval. So confidence interval is um, typically uh, is the width from the mean. Uh, so mean could be a mean of blood pressure within one group, or mean could be a mean difference of a blood pressure between two groups. So mean could be anything. But uh, how you construct confidence interval is you compute the standard error, and then do two times, and then you do mean plus minus two times SC. So that gives you confidence interval. And what is the utility of that? Utility of that is that so when uh, confidence interval includes a no value, okay, and then that links to the p value and less than, uh, I mean, greater than 0.05. Okay. So, <coughs> uh, okay. so what I put in here is if you are comparing mean of absolute change, what would be a new value of that? So mean blood pressure of 100 versus 110. Absolute difference is 10. Okay, And then you put the confidence interval around that. And then what do you look? Whether zero is included in the interval, right? Because for absolute difference, zero is a value you expect if there is no difference. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the ratio, odds ratio, or relative risk, or hazard ratio, what is the new value? One. one. Okay. So uh, then you judge whether the one is sitting in, in, within the confidence interval or not. So if you have a confidence interval, you don't really have to show the p-value. Okay. So if the confidence interval includes a new value, you know again, A and B in this case, right? New value is right here. So this is the lowest and highest interval of confidence interval. Some confidence interval is very narrow and some are very large. And uh, what you do is look whether the new value is sitting within the confidence interval. So A and B indicate p value greater than 0.05. So if you have confidence interval, you don't have to even put the p value. Okay. And there was one point in the history, and it's some journal, uh, the EPI journal, Start telling people get rid of p value from your paper and just put confidence interval. Get that in. But then <laughs> many people get confused and then they are wanting p value. So now we are back and we are demanding people to put the both confidence interval and p value. So you have readers to understand what's happening. Okay, so which one do you prefer? If you have to want one confidence interval p value, which one would you pick? Now we can put both, but just assume, just assume you are allowed to use one, either one. Which one? CI, CI or is that? Okay, so, uh, so here, if you only look at the p-value, you can't really tell what the difference between A and B, right? So p-value could be like 0.3 for both cases. But you know for sure A and B, something is different, right? So what is different? 
and did the sums. So, again, so now let's review. How would we compute confidence interval? First, you start with standard deviation. Right? Standard deviation is average distance between each point to the mean. Yeah, that's a standard deviation. And then standard error, you divide that by square root of n. So big n, you have a smaller standard error, okay? and twice of that give you confidence interval. That means big n give you smaller confidence interval. Large, a small n give you large confidence interval. Okay? And so, when you test equivalence, which one do you need to have? Equivalence, you're not trying to show different. So either A and B, right? So for the study showing equivalence, you need to show A. So difference between drug blood pressure between drug A and drug B is zero. Or could be one. Clinically is I mean, not a little difference, right? And the confidence interval is very narrow. So worst scenario, you show the difference of two or difference of three, but you know for sure and that's within that range. Okay. So it could be, I mean, it could be negative, negative two or it could be positive two or yeah. anyway. For equivalence, you have to show confidence interval is narrow enough to estimate the difference with that. So, uh, again, a uh, clinical example. So this is a paper uh, we published uh, from a New England, Journal of Medicine, New England Journal of Medicine. And what we wanted to show is uh, coronary calcification. Okay. Lupus is a risk factor for coronary calcification. But anyway, in this table, uh, we limit the analysis to only lupus patients. And we wanted to see risk factor for coronary. Diastolic blood pressure and give odds ratio of 1 and p value is very high. Okay. And creatinine and p value is high, no, not as high as this, but anyway, it's not less than 0.05. And then odds ratio is 3.96. Okay. So now you know how to make use of confidence interval. So which one do you think have nothing to do with? If you pick one, both are statistically insignificant. Still <laughs> that <hurt>? Is it? <laughs> you will get with the clinical numbers. So what happens if um, you increase sample size? Here we have only uh, sixty-five patients. If you can enroll like 10 more, what do you think it happened? This two. With a little bit more, okay, confidence interval of mine is going to go smaller, and then that may uh, discriminate one from this interval. Okay? So higher the end, you start out with smaller confidence interval. Okay? So, uh, creatinine is a still a good candidate, right? Because you might see the significance by increasing N. But what happens if you increase N in this case? <laughs> it's going toward one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so even if you enroll like 100 more patients, and this still probably improve one. Yeah. So the p-value alone does not give you that information, but the confidence interval does. So uh, we do want to use confidence interval. 